Welcome to this webinar discussing future perspectives on data governance and data integrity. We are going to spend some time today exploring the trends in the industry that are making us reimagine our relationship with data and knowledge and how to meet the regulatory requirements of data integrity as these trends evolve. My name is Yash Sabarwal, and I am a co-founder and the CEO of QBD Vision. QBD Vision is a project that was started in 2017 to address the challenges of master data and knowledge management for the pharmaceutical and biotech industries with a specific focus on the chemistry, manufacturing, and controls work streams of the product development lifecycle. We will be covering five main themes in the webinar, starting with the current challenges of unstructured data. Next, we will discuss the concept of the data quality pyramid and why structuring data is critical to supporting the data quality paradigm. From there, we will dive into the structured data approach for CMC work streams and demonstrate specific examples of how a structured data paradigm can drive automation and compliance with regulatory requirements. Finally, we will discuss the growing interest from regulatory agencies in structured data and how it can support structured submissions to facilitate review and inspections in a more focused and objective manner. We are all well aware as an industry of the challenges we face with respect to compliance with data integrity requirements. While the trends relative to data integrity have not been encouraging over the past few years, we are only now starting to examine the underlying issues that create consistent challenges. From our perspective, poor data integrity has its roots in the underlying data governance policies that are struggling to adapt to the significantly higher volumes of data especially digital data that is being generated today. A sound strategy requires high quality data with specific attention to data governance policies and procedures. How does data management look today? It is a collection of documents, spreadsheets, notebooks, emails, PowerPoints, and the tacit knowledge in people's heads. This leads to the unstructured data problem. Biomanufacturing data is growing exponentially, with a single facility sometimes generating upwards of 10 petabytes of data per year. 70 to 80 percent of this manufacturing data remains unstructured, and as a result, a majority of unstructured data is not utilized. In this type of situation, data is not easily converted into institutional knowledge. This further drives a number of operational inefficiencies. It challenges the Alcoa principles of data integrity, leads to poor understanding of manufacturing process and capability, leading to a, a number of programs having underdeveloped control strategies. Furthermore, it complicates translation from clinical to commercial manufacturing, with tech transfers for vaccines, for example, taking upwards of 18 months or longer. In this section, we will explore the concept of the data quality pyramid with specific attention to data governance as a necessary element for strong data integrity. Here we have a definition of data governance from the PICS guidance on good practices for data management and integrity published in 2021. There are three interesting elements of this definition highlighted in the text. First, it includes the elements of data integrity outlined in the Alcoa framework, with some additional com components included. Second, it specifically denotes a life cycle of data, which may be separate from the life cycle of the product. Finally, it refers to a quote unquote sum total of arrangements, which is intentionally vague, but likely refers to the elements of data governance, which need to ensure the elements of data integrity. The data quality pyramid includes both governance and integrity, but also considers the element of data culture, which is the foundation of high data quality since it reflects the organizational mindset towards its data. This mindset is then operationalized with a sum total of arrangements, which represents the data governance layer. The combination of the right mindset and the right operational posture then produce the desired outcome of high data integrity. 
The balance of this discussion will focus on the strategies required for successful data governance to improve operational data integrity. First, let's start with what it means to be digital. There is a lot of discussion today about digital transformation, but when does data truly become digital? Many organizations, for better or worse, are still highly dependent on paper-based systems. Most organizations also have significant amounts of data in electronic formats, whether they are documents, spreadsheets, presentations, etc. However, the key point is that electronic formats are often just the same representations of information that you see on paper, but now on a computer. This is often referred to as paper on glass. The many electronic document man management and quality systems are paper on glass as they replicate paper-based workflows on a computer. Data becomes digital when it becomes atomic. In other words, when a data point can be separately addressed, it has become digital. The diagram all the way to the right shows a relational database where digital records are linked, or the knowledge graph where individual elements of information can be depicted as connected webs of relationships. Each record or each node is separately addressable and connected to other similar types of objects. In order to make the transition from electronic to digital, there needs to be a well-defined structure for the data being captured. So what is the best structure? One credible structure that is gaining a lot of attention recently is the FAIR structure. This is a functional definition of digital data where the key elements are really objectives. Specifically, the solutions and technologies deployed should ensure that data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. When data is findable, it is easily searched and readily located using rich and consistent metadata. When it is accessible, this data and met metadata is easily retrievable by unique identifiers. When it's interoperable, data can be readily integrated with other systems. And when it's reusable, metadata and data are well described with relevant and accurate attributes. Fair principles are the data governance complement to the Alcoa data integrity framework. We will use an analogy with health outcomes here to hopefully make the point. From the health outcomes perspective, we usually think of the properties of our body and measure these to evaluate our health. When these outcomes are not in balance, we can either take medications, specifically pinpointing each outcome, or we can change our behavior that will also bring the desired outcomes, but usually in a more holistic and enduring way. Similarly, our data integrity has to have certain properties to ensure that it has high integrity. A strong data culture and a strong data governance backbone built on a fair data structure represent behavioral and functional strategies that can bring about the desired outcomes, but in a more holistic and enduring way. The FAIR approach can benefit many data domains within the biomanufacturing and CMC lifecycle, from product definition, to process development, to risk management, control strategies, and more. So how do these principles work for the universe of data in the biomanufacturing world? Well, let's first see what this universe of data actually looks like. This slide shows the multiple dimensions of CMC data and some of the associated risk assessments that are executed during the development lifecycle. A key point to note here is that ultimately, the multiple streams of information have to come together to support regulatory review and approval and the transition from clinical manufacturing to commercial manufacturing. As product and process development proceeds over the life cycle, all of the information is essentially captured in paper and electronic documents with very little integration. The body of information is comprised of various documents and spreadsheets dispersed across multiple systems or SharePoint folders. So, for example, if there is a change in a critical material, 
There is no way to easily assess the impact of this change on critical quality attributes and patient safety or efficacy. Instead, teams of SMEs often have to pour through various documents to assemble the information that can lead to an appropriate impact assessment and subsequent strategy for handling this change to the process. Such an exercise can take weeks or even months. As data grows exponentially, the approach just described is becoming increasingly intractable. With the power of computing available today, a better approach is to break apart all of the data in documents into atomic elements of data. As these data elements are organized into relevant categories, the data has context converting it into information. This approach is effectively indexing the content in the documents, not the documents themselves. These atomic data nodes can then be linked together to build a multidimensional, structured knowledge base, which can then be visualized in many different ways not possible when this information is buried inside of documents. As we just pointed out, both structure and integration are necessary to build knowledge. The structure should be holistic and aligned with regulatory expectations. Here is one example of a structure that we have deployed. You see the patient requirements often reflected in a target product profile, product requirements often found in a QTPP, risk management definitions, process definitions and requirements, data suppliers, and all the other elements of a CMC program that need to be defined over the life cycle. Structural elements are then layered together to build a vertically integrated knowledge base with each layer having its roots in the ICH guidelines. The foundational layer assembles the patient product and process requirements as defined in ICHQ8. Next, the principles of quality risk management outlined in ICHQ9 are folded in to make risk assessment integral to the knowledge base. Next, data generated during the development lifecycle and any analysis, uh, that has, analyses that have been run should be included and folded back into the system and these layers as a feedback loop into uh, refinements for risk assessments and specifications for each of the requirements. Finally, as general recipes evolve into site recipes, the tangible assets of production are, are layered in to the vertical, vertically integrated knowledge base. And all this information comes together to define the requisite product and process control strategies, as well as the strategies for life cycle management post approval in accordance with ICHQ 12. Returning to the universe of information, this approach of atomizing, assembling, and linking data connects digital objects using digital threads to create a digital fabric for CMC knowledge. Now, if there is a change to a material for a process, the impact of this change on critical quality attributes and hence patient safety and efficacy can be assessed quickly because the connections or digital threads can be followed through the maze to see this relationship. Now let's think about the application of these concepts and how they come together to support master data and knowledge management with the requisite attention to data integrity. Taking a step back, let's revisit the CMC lifecycle, which is growing more complex with the various gene and cell therapeutic modalities in development. The guiding approach for product development is outlined in the three stages of process validation, going from design to qualification to CPP. Sponsors and contract manufacturers undertake a series of development activities as they move through these stages, from early process development to scale up and optimization to characterization and so on. In alignment with these development activities, a detailed risk-based control strategy framework should be developed to demonstrate robust process understanding, process capability, and control as production moves from preclinical to clinical to commercial manufacturing. Finally, all of these work streams need to be completed for each manufacturing activity, whether it is a raw material or the finished product. 
However, it is a consistent challenge for sponsors to build this control strategy in alignment with their development activities. Risk assessments are often retroactive and often based on tacit knowledge instead of direct data tying process capability to specification risk. These requirements for the development of a risk-based control strategy framework are clearly outlined in ICHQ8 and many of the other ICH guidelines. Here we look specifically at some of the sections of ICHQ8, which clearly call for the definition of a QTPP. Section 2.3 discusses the use of risk assessments to link attributes and parameters to drug product CQAs, and Section 2.5, which describes the, EL, the key elements of a control strategy. Yet, many organizations struggle to create and manage these constructs to capture information as their development programs evolve. Let's take a look at how the structured data principles discussed earlier can be used to build a digital QTPP. The principles are broken down into a three-step approach where data is atomized, assembled, and then linked to build a digital construct that meets the ICHQ8 requirements. You can also see how this works in practice with an example. The QTPP is often managed as a comprehensive, controlled document. Even though it should be drafted at the start of a development program, many organizations don't draft one until they are well into the development process, which is at odds with the quality by design principle of starting with the end in mind. However, the document is really a collection of separate elements primarily product quality attributes. In this first step, we atomize the data by converting the document form into separate data objects. Once the elements of the QTPP are defined separately, they can be managed and tracked separately, effectively indexing the content of, Q of the QTPP. The capability to revise individual elements is more efficient than revising a full document when any change is made to one element and encourages better data governance and data integrity. In step two, we assemble this information into a coherent structure by categorizing the elements based on the language of ICH, QBD, and good manufacturing practices. In this case, we are categorizing the elements of the QTPP as general attributes, quality attributes, and performance attributes. Plus, each attribute can have its own rich set of metadata, such as risk assessments, acceptance criteria, and control methods, as prescribed by the FAIR principles discussed earlier. Step 3, we link these records to create relationships between records, which creates context and provides justification for decisions made throughout the development process. In this way, quality attributes can be linked to safety and efficacy. Process parameters and material attributes can be linked to quality attributes as prescribed by Section 2.3 of ICHQ8. Let's see some of these concepts in action. Here is a digital representation of a quality target product profile. In this example, we use the AMAB case study that was published back in 2009. You can see in this digital representation that we have a collection of general attributes, quality attributes, and performance attributes, where each attribute is represented as a separate digital object. We go into one of the digital objects, let's say aggregation, for example. We can see that the record has a rich set of data encompassing many dimensions. And so what we're going to go through here is an example of how a data structure, a highly, a highly digitized data structure, allows you to link a lot of different pieces of information together to build a story around a particular uh, requirement. So in this case, we have uh, starting with a header section where we can define what the scope of this attribute is. Is it drug substance? Is it drug product? Uh, what's the ICHQ6B category? Descriptions, tracing to target product profiles. Next, we begin the criticality assessment. So now we're layering in or folding in the ICHQ9 requirements into the ICHQ8 QTPP definition with this requirement. Here, we have separately risk assessed aggregation against efficacy, PK, PD, immunogenicity, and safety as they did in the case study. And each separate risk assessment is shown here 
um, with uh, the ability to see where these definitions came from. So a risk management plan can also be defined. That risk management plan can be associated with a project and then used uh, for the risk assessment purposes. Justifications are provided. You can quickly see that the, the key culprit for uh, criticality here for aggregation is its impact on PKPD. And, uh, and then uh, we continue with uh, the next set of information, which is acceptance criteria. So understanding the criticality of the requirement and understanding what ranges are important and how they've evolved from prior knowledge to in vitro studies to non-clinical studies to clinical experience and so forth, uh, being able to link in the control method. So how is this particular requirement being tested? Any additional links or attachments? <clears throat> Uh, and then we begin to look at process capability. And so this is the occurrence layer of risk, uh, say within an FMEA model. Of course, it would be helpful to understand what the justification for this risk is, and it should it should be based on uh, the actual data from your uh, process runs. So we can look at that as well. And uh, so here's an example of the data, uh, the batch data that was linked in, uh, brought into the system for this particular requirement. And it's now linked to this requirement, and so we can see very clearly where um, how well our process is performing, uh, control charts, et cetera. The interesting thing in this particular example is that while the CPK looks great, the CPM doesn't because the target is actually not symmetric uh, between the lower and upper limits. So for this particular uh, example, you would want to keep the occurrence risk at very high because the CPM is actually not um, um, a very good value. So a perfect example of how data can help ultimately justify uh, the underlying risk. Finally, if there's residual risk um, after uh, implementing all your controls, uh, the question then will be how you're going to uh, detect, detect this, if there's any problem in the, in the actual process, and uh, what your control strategy will be around that, which in this case has both release testing and in-process testing um, flagged for this particular requirement. Now, uh, from a data integrity perspective, uh, you can see here that uh, each record can be uh, approved via a 21 CFR part compliant approach. And uh, the nice thing in this case is that uh, tracking changes uh, when your data is highly structured is a lot easier than trying to track them in a um, text-based narrative such as a document. So for example, if you want to see the difference between 5.0 and 4.0, it's very easy to do so because we can um, uh, compare uh, the two uh, structured records and uh, highlight in red where changes were made. So uh, from a perspective of understanding what changed and when it changed and why it changed, um, a structured approach makes that a lot simpler than having to sort through two separate documents and look for, uh, look for the actual changes there. Now, if you actually wanted to create a document um, from a data integrity and data governance perspective, you have... Um, uh, another opportunity here with a structured format. So in this example, um, you can see uh, a critical quality attribute assessment. Um, and if we scroll down, uh, there's various uh, elements to this, to this document. Some of these are typed in by hand, but for the key data, uh, they're linked to the actual database. So if we come here and we look at uh, the summary quality target product profile, um, or we look here at the um, general attributes um, that were listed in the digital representation, uh, we can see that this information was actually not hand typed in, but it was um, uh, drawn directly from the database. So uh, in this example, you've built a, uh, a constructed a table, and when the document is generated, it will pull the data from the database, which actually comes from the approved version uh, of the pro of the uh, of the of the record. And so now you've built um, uh, or automated, if you will, uh, in many ways, the data governance and data integrity around the generation of the critical quality attribute assessment report based on the underlying structured data. The previous discussion around the QTPP provided a demonstration of how a digital QTPP can be created based on FAIR principles driving strong data governance and data integrity. Here, we continue the demonstration by creating a sample conversation that might take place between an inspector and a sponsor. 
In many instances, these conversations are handled by setting up the inspector with the sponsor's key SMEs in one room. The sponsor has a separate room where all of the documents are available to be brought to the inspector to answer these questions as they are asked. This can be a time-consuming process for all involved and challenging if it is difficult to locate the relevant documents or if the requested information is spread across multiple documents. Finally, tracing data from conclusions back through analysis to raw data to ensure data integrity can be very challenging. A structured digital approach has the potential to change this dynamic for all involved. Looking at this conversation, it may go something like this. Can I see a process flow map of your manufacturing process? Can I see a list of your critical quality attributes and their control methods? Which process parameters affect this particular critical quality attribute? And are these process parameters critical? Can you show me the FMA for unit operation X in your process? What is the control strategy for sterility for your drug product pill finish? What is the process capability for bioburden as an in-process control for, st for sterility? Let's see how this conversation might unfold with a digital structure underlying all the information to be shared and linked uh, across uh, all the different dimensions in your CMC program. Here we are looking at a digital representation of an upstream process in the AMAB case study. Referring back to our conversation around a CMC program, the question was, can I see a process flow map of your manufacturing process? When information is digitized in this format, you can quickly pull up a digitized version of the process flow map. In this scenario, the flow map is being generated based on the underlying digital process definition. So you can see here for each unit operation, we are showing input materials, components, attributes, and parameters all as inputs, and then intermediate attributes, whether they're quality or performance, um, and final attributes, also whether they're quality or performance, as outputs of the unit operation. For each unit operation, you can see uh, the information for each of these categories. Parameters and attributes that are critical are tagged based on their color, and these maps can be interactive because they're digital, showing, say, only critical um, uh, variables that are inputs and outputs to uh, these unit operations. So this is an example of how um, a digitally defined process can generate a process flow map. The next question was, can I see a list of your CQAs and their control methods? Again, going back to our QTPP definition, we see here a table view of all the critical quality attributes that were defined for the AMAB case study. If you want to check uh, the critical quality attributes only, there's a nice uh, opportunity here to filter uh, by, the, by the label. And so now you're seeing the information in a filtered and sorted format, uh, showing acceptance criteria, along with the control methods and the control strategies for each of the critical quality attributes. Again, having digitally defined information where information has rich metadata around it uh, simplifies the ability to show this information uh, and share it with uh, your team, with an inspector, or any other um, individual that might be interested in looking at it. Next question was, well, will PPs affect a particular CQA and are they critical? So let's take, for example, the aggregation um, CQA. We're interested in understanding what might be impacting that. Um, uh, opportunity for a digital structure also gives you the opportunity to rethink how you might uh, depict this information. So while the industry has traditionally used fishbone diagrams to evaluate how inputs might affect outputs, uh, moving to a fully digital structure where each element of information is, is atomic allows you to actually trace um, every input to every output to generate what is called a knowledge graph. So in this view, um, the knowledge graph is, is filtering on aggregation and also filtering on all the inputs 
uh, direct and indirect that might be impacting aggregation um, in this particular um, manufacturing process. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, these are all color coded by risk, so you can very quickly see which uh, which um, intermediate quality attributes in this case and which process parameters are critical um, to answer the question that was posed around which which process parameters may be critical to um, your uh, aggregation CQA. The next question was, can you show me the FMEA for the for unit operation X? Just as we showed with the uh, document engine, uh, reports uh, can be generated um, out of this approach where the report itself is taking data from the database. So again, from a data governance and data integrity perspective, uh, you are really um, uh, making all of those uh, parameters much better because uh, you're not managing an FMEA in a separate Excel spreadsheet, which has its own uh, train of, of control. Uh, the, the FMEA can be generated at any particular point in time as a, as a fixed report um, utilizing the data that's in the system. So in this example, this FMEA is showing you a process parameter, um, uh, actually showing the process parameters for all the um, uh, for, for this particular unit operation, so every single parameter is listed here. Um, you can see which uh, component it's linked to, what product quality or downstream variables it might be affecting, its actual risk label, so on and so forth. This is a standard format for an FMEA uh, depiction, but the key point here is that you can see what the initial risk assessment is, and, um, and if this, say, was done at an earlier uh, date, you would see that information uh, and then if there's any recommended actions uh, and what and, and if those actions have been taken, then a uh, follow up uh, risk assessment can also be shown to see how those risk, how those risks were mitigated uh, based on these two dates. So um, a, a digital approach also allows uh, capture of information over um, time. So you're seeing the time based evolution of the information as well. Um, but uh, the key point here being that data governance and data integrity is strong because uh, the data is being managed digitally. It uh, can be approved electronically via electronic signature, and of course, uh, and then is just um, pulled to to be displayed in a report, uh, as opposed to having a separate FMEA report that is uh, separately being controlled, and then there has to be uh, a lot of work around verification and validation of where that data came from. Next question in the conversation was, what is the control strategy for sterility for your drug product fill finish? So now we move to a different process. Um, here we've defined a simple formulation, sterile filtration and filling process. Um, you can note that uh, for any process, whether it's this one or um, back here at the uh, AMAB upstream, uh, there's a lot more detail that's underlying uh, each of these unit operations. So this is where the data is coming from to support this, this these reporting capabilities. You see process parameters um, for each unit operation. Um, you can see the equipment that it's linked to um, and materials and components and so on and so forth. Uh, and so we've done uh, something similar here where we've built a, a simple formulation filtration filling process. And if we want to uh, look at the control strategy uh, for sterility, we would pull up our standard uh, knowledge graph map uh, that we were showing earlier. And, uh, and now you see a simpler version of, um, of this uh, manufacturing process where you know, concentration, endotoxin, and sterility have been defined as CQAs. Um, if you wanted to see the control strategy for sterility, you would uh, uh, the sterility CQA. Uh, you would come in here and ask the system to show all the upstream variables, and then you would layer in the control strategy tags that have been um, provided in each, in each of the uh, metadata records. And so, um, again, now we're talking about uh, a very fair system where it's findable, it's accessible, it's interoperable and reusable. We have rich metadata around each of these uh, variables. And this allows us to generate a map 
in this fashion where we can see the CQA, that sterility, it has been tagged as uh, release testing and in process testing. And then you can see going back into each of the unit operations, for example, in filling, sterility will be tested upon in completion as an in-process test. Uh, at sterile filtration, it will be tested upon completion as well as an in-process test. But it, this sterility also has in-process controls. And coming back this way, we see that bioburden is a will be tested upon completion as an in-process control. So you're getting a very vi quick visual map of what the control strategy looks like. And then the next question was, what is your process capability for bioburden as an in-process control for stability? So coming in, we can layer in again uh, the process capability. Here we're utilizing batches that were um, completed during validation. And um, you see here that now this has been labeled orange. And if you look, you can see the actual process capability has been rated as marginal, um, which would obviously raise some questions. Um, you may be interested in uh, understanding how the uh, bio burden will look, say, in the registration batches. And here we see that uh, it was much better. Process capability number is a lot higher and rated as good. Um, and of course, this would then allow you to think about, well, um, where is this data coming from? So if you were to uh, click into this particular object, now you are seeing um, all the batches uh, that uh, have been uh, created with where bioburden was measured. And uh, you may be interested in looking at a particular uh, batch. So you come into engineering three batch here and um, you would see the actual data um, that was uh, generated for bioburden. Um, you can see where the data came from. So it was imported via an Excel file. And of course, then the next question would be, well, where's the primary data? And therefore, um, the batch data record should be um, attached here as a supporting document. Uh, because it's not here, you see that there's a, a, there's a problem from a data integrity perspective. So if the Excel data was here and the, and the original batch record was here, you'd have, a, um, you'd have um, traceability all the way back to the raw data. Um, because it's missing, um, there's, a, there's clearly a data integrity issue that needs to be resolved. So, um, you know, uh, so this conversation has has walked through a variety of different types of information, but instead of, you know, uh, having to go and retrieve documents to, um, to uh, you know, sort through the documents to pull this information together, a, a holistic, structured, multidimensional data set uh, allows you to walk through this conversation uh, in a very straightforward way. Um, with uh, with um, excellent data governance and data integrity if uh, this type of approach has been taken. In the final installment of this conversation, we are going to look at how the regulatory environment is shifting to the concepts of structured data and structured submissions. First, let's look at how the digital ecosystem for CMC is evolving rapidly. There have been a number of electronic and digital solutions in use for decades, from ERP systems to EQMS to manufacturing execution and more. More recently, systems for primary and raw data are advancing rapidly to deal with the significant challenges of spreadsheet-based data management and CPV. New electronic lab notebooks and laboratory information management systems, data lakes, and more are proliferating in the industry. Now we are seeing the advent of knowledge management solutions to serve as a backbone for all of this information to better support integration and traceability of data back to the source. As integration grows between these different types of solutions, it will improve overall data governance and integrity across the board. There are a number of trends towards structured data paradigms these days, including case studies from industry trade organizations such as Bioforum, Nimble, and more, highlighting the importance of QBD-based CMC development for all therapeutic modalities. There is open discussion by the FDA and EMA about structured data and cloud-based submissions and assessments, 
And as you may be aware, the FDA has their own initiative for knowledge-aided assessments and structured applications called CASA, which has been deployed for generics and is being extended to other types of drug applications. Another very key activity underway is the revision of ICH-M4Q to improve submission and assessment efficiency. A concept paper has already been drafted and the industry has responded with their perspective as well. In this response, they identified six key objectives taken from the concept paper, each starting with the letter E. For the purposes of this discussion, I have highlighted the fifth objective because it specifically notes the enablement of digital tools for structured pharmaceutical quality submissions. Links to both the concept paper and the industry perspective are provided at the bottom of this slide. Summarizing the key themes of this discussion, we know that data volumes will continue to grow exponentially, challenging data governance in the absence of structured frameworks. We have recasted data integrity as an outcome of the data quality pyramid, highly dependent on data culture and data governance. We believe that the FAIR structure is a functional and contextual data paradigm, well suited to supporting data governance and the overall data quality pyramid across the spectrum of data processing requirements and personas. The FAIR data paradigm needs well defined taxonomies and ontologies to build the rich data and metadata schemas required. For CMC activities and product quality assessments, the ICH guidelines coupled with QBD principles provide the necessary taxonomies and, and ontologies to support this FAIR approach for CMC data and data quality. Regulatory agencies understand the need for structured data paradigms and are already moving in this direction to leverage cloud-based technologies which can drive better data governance and integrity. We would like to thank you for your time and attention today, and we look forward to continuing this dialogue with all of the various stakeholders in the industry.